Tonight's reenactments and commentary may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Sex, lies, videotape, those are the key elements in the Michael Jackson trial as we enter day two. Prosecutors say it's about sex. The defense claims it's all a bunch of lies. The question, did the king of pop molest a teenage boy as the state has charged? Welcome to the Michael Jackson trial and E! News presentation. I'm James Curtis. With no cameras in the courtroom in Santa Maria, California, we're bringing you reenactments of the trial's key moments, all based on actual courtroom transcripts, all with commentary and analysis from one of the best legal team of experts you'll see anywhere. Let's get right to the action. Defense attorney Thomas Mesereau continued his opening statement hammering away at the reputation of the accuser's mother. A woman he says was out to shake down Michael Jackson. Here's how it happened, according to courtroom transcripts. Ladies and gentlemen, we will prove that Janet and her children are using this case to win a civil case. Your Honor, I'm going to object to that as argumentative. Sustained. We will also prove that her lawyer, Larry Feldman, who the prosecutor acknowledged had sued Mr. Jackson a long time ago, a lawyer very well known in Beverly Hills, California, we will prove to you that this lawyer was having lunch with CNN talk show host Larry King and told him she wants money. Ladies and gentlemen, the prosecutor yesterday alleged that acts of molestation occurred during certain dates. We will prove to you that most of those dates, not all of them, but most of them, Michael Jackson wasn't even near Neverland. Based upon our investigation, we can find four approximate dates where he was at Neverland. But a lot of the dates you heard the prosecutor identify he isn't even near the place. Hmm. Joining me now are legal team of analysts, Sean Chapman Holly, Ricky Kleeman, and Howard Weitzman. Sean Chapman Holly, managing partner of the Johnny Cochran Law Firm, member of the OJ defense team that successfully defended OJ Simpson. Ricky Kleeman, right. today's show and court TV analyst and the credits go on and on. We'll get to them as we go throughout our analysis here. Howard Weitzman, trial attorney extraordinaire, having represented Michael Jackson on an unrelated matter. Sean, let me start with you today. We noticed in that piece of uh, courtroom action we saw just a moment ago an objection at the outset in the opening statement as argumentative. Those objections aren't often heard in the opening statements. Does it tell us anything about the relative abilities of either side? Well, you know, th it struck me really that objection because I didn't find it to be argumentative at all, notwithstanding the fact that the judge sustained the objection. What I really wonder and think what's happening here is Mr. Snedden is trying to interrupt Mr. Mesereau's flow because he's got a flow going and yeah, he wants yeah, to try yeah, to Yeah, 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 but stop Howard, it. is that really a fair comment? I mean, after all, Mr. Mesereau did object to Mr. Snedden's opening statement. Well, first of all, I think Mr. Mesereau's first objection was well taken and the judge was wrong. Secondly, I think this train is on the track, and I am curious and concerned whether this judge has an agenda. Hard for me to tell because I'm not there. An agenda? An agenda. How so? I think sometimes judges have a way of pushing things along, maybe without even realizing what they're doing. This objection, in, in my opinion, was not well taken. I do believe it interrupted the flow, and the judge allowed it to take Interesting. place. Interesting. Ricky Kleeman, I want to talk to you about that, but first let me get to this other issue. Larry King, again, the stars are paraded out in, form, in the form of this opening statement. What do you make of it? Well, I think that if Tom Mesereau can produce Larry King, and if Larry King can say that her lawyer, the accused boy's mother, Janet, let's give her a name, Janet, that Janet's lawyer, Larry Feldman, basically says... She wants the money. She's in it for the yep. money. That's great evidence for the defense. It certainly shows bias. And it's the whole defense of Michael Jackson that really this was all about money in the first place. What do you make of the relative dynamic of the two sides? I frankly think the objection should have been sustained. I think the objection was okay. But notwithstanding we're, that... We're against you on this okay, one. Okay, <laughs> well, defense and prosecution, that's okay. That's what we're about. But the idea of what I see, just a little bit of insight, do you think, the relative abilities of each side, because 
Mesro objected during Snedden's, uh, direct, Snedden's uh, opening statement. Snedden objects here, but we'll find out and we'll show you later on that those objections stop and what I think is argument continues in his opening statement of Mesro. Well, I think that we look at opening statement as different from closing argument. One is called argument, one is called statement. The reality is this. It's advocacy. And advocacy is by its very nature argumentative. We understand what the rules of yeah, evidence are. Yeah. We understand what the rules of procedure are. Both of these lawyers are good lawyers. They want to persuade this jury, and they're going to do it the best way they know how. I, 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 I want to say an this. Argument. Go ahead, you, real quick. You, you mentioned opening st statement. Mesero, I mean, Snedden violated a court order out of the box when he started That's true. mentioning That's the true. finances. Yes. The judge sustained it, and from then on, Snedden continued to argue, in my opinion, and Mesro, for whatever his reasons, did not object. All right, Sean, real quick. I was just going to say, it's not argument. He's saying we're going to prove what this is all about. All How right. is that argument? All right, all right. Hey, we're going to continue our argument, non-argument, advocacy, in the words of Ricky Kleeman, in just a moment. As defense attorney Tom Mesro wrapped up his opening statement, though, he dropped what could be a bombshell. Was it just a figure of speech, or was it a signal to these jurors that Michael Jackson, Jackson himself will take the witness stand? You decide for yourself. Here's what happened according to the courtroom's transcripts. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Jackson will tell you one time at Neverland he got a very bad feeling and intuition. They were in the theater that you've heard about. There is a theater at Neverland where you can just go in and kids can have their seats. It's on an incline. You've got a stage and you've got a big screen. He was there with Janet and the three kids, Gavin, Starr, and Davilin. And all of a sudden, Janet grabs Michael's hand and has her children all hold hands. And she says, let's all kneel down and pray with our daddy, Michael. And Michael Jackson got a very bad feeling. And after that, he concluded, I got to get away. I got to get away. I love helping this child, but something is wrong. And we will prove to you that he was warned by others, get away. That was, of course, attorney Tom Mesereau. This is some very interesting stuff and a lot of detail, Ricky Kleeman. A lot of detail. I have no doubt in my mind, I will bet the house on it, Tom Mesereau is putting Michael Jackson on, not just because of what he said here, which is clear that he's putting Jackson on, but Tom Mesereau has a preference for putting clients on Why? the witness stand. Why? I, by the way, never want to put a client on the witness stand, but he has always said that. He feels that way. He believes it. And if he thinks from his work with Michael Jackson that people might think that Michael Jackson perhaps is a bit odd, but that he's so odd that yeah. he's telling the truth. He is going on, and that Mesereau, when he do, was defending Robert Blake, would have put Blake on the witness stand. All right, Sean Chapman Holly, we've just heard the preference of one of the top five, five female trial attorneys in the country, so voted. You were a part of the team that successfully defended O.J. Simpson. O.J. didn't take the stand. What say you? Right. Well, you know, I think a jury always wants to hear from the defendant. They always do. Yeah. Even though, of course, there's a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent and not to testify, yeah. juries want to hear from you. And, you know, I frankly am not surprised that Mr. Jackson is going to take the stand. Um, you know, he is odd. And I do think that he can tell a compelling tale, and I think he will. I think that's going to be one of the big issues, though. Howard, I can't tell you how many times, as a prosecutor, I've said across from the defense attorney who says, you're going to hear from my client, didn't happen. And we know from the Jason Williams trial, the first one that happened last year, Billy Martin, you're going to hear from Jason Williams, never happened. Let me tell you, um, it depends on the circumstances and the defendant. Way back when, when I was defending John DeLorean, who everybody wanted to hear from. Sure. I'd never put him on the stand, couldn't take the risk. In this case, and you know, I know Michael fairly well, a representative some years ago, he can be very articulate, he has a story to tell, and if what Mr. Mesereau has told us is in truth what Mr. Jackson is going to say, I think it's extremely powerful. Pray with Daddy Michael. Boy, that's frightening stuff. And especially if he can document Tom Mesereau, those statements given by the accused's mother. Coming up next, jurors get to see Martin Bashir, the documentary that triggered the Jackson investigation. Stay with us. Tonight's reenactment.
statements and commentary may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back to the Michael Jackson trial. An Ian e News presentation. The prosecution's first witness was Martin Bashir. He's the journalist whose documentary, Living with Michael Jackson, was the springboard for this state's investigation. When it aired, the world heard some very controversial statements from Jackson. And in that courtroom, the jury got to hear those statements as well. According to the transcripts, here's how it happened. Oh, go forward. Your Honor, we're ready? Yes. Why well, can't you share your bid? The, the, the most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. You, know? really, you really think that? Yeah, so of course. You're taking a position that you use yeah. every single night that you go into. You sleep and you're sharing it with another. You say you can thing. have my bed if you want. Sleep in it. I'll sleep on the floor. You can. It's yours. I always give the best to the company, you know. Like to him, I said, because he was going to sleep on the floor. I said, no, you sleep in the bed. I'll sleep on the floor. But haven't you got uh, giving the bed to the company, that's what brought Michael Jackson to this courtroom. And a quick note about the teen's face being blurred. The jury saw the actual clean footage, the teen's face in clear detail. Howard Weissman, we're talking about and we're hearing reports out of the courtroom about reactions of Michael Jackson. One has to do with Michael Jackson perhaps crying, at least dabbing his face. The other has to do with perhaps Michael Jackson tapping his foot, reminiscent of the standing on top of the SUV footage we saw pre-trial. Let's deal with the first one. You represented Michael Jackson. You know him well. What do you make of the dabbing of the face? Well, I, I think Michael has always had a habit of touching his, his nose, taking a handkerchief or a Kleenex, covering his nose. He's very sensitive about the way his nose looks. Um, I find it hard to believe that there were tears in his eyes, and I think it's preposterous to think he was tapping to the, mu to the music as if he was on top of the SUV. I, I think it's clear Michael's angry and Michael's upset about what's taking now, place. Now, conflicting reports, Sean Chapman Holly, coming out of that courtroom, let's deal with the tapping of the music, about when it happened. We're not real clear about when this alleged supposed tapping happened, but apparently well, there was some music being played on some prior uh, video or some other evidence that came in. Is it relevant? Does it make a difference? Well, it only makes a difference insofar as the jury is paying attention to every single thing that Michael yeah. Jackson does. And if he's tapping to the music, the jury may think he's not taking this, this case and this yeah. trial very seriously. Mr. Mesereau, though, has like, I think, a tight rein on Mr. Jackson, and I would be surprised if he was allowing him to bop to music. Now, Ricky, different folks in this courtroom have different vantage points. They interpret and see things a little bit differently. What's the dynamic in this courtroom going to be like with respect to whether he was dabbing, whether he was crying? Well, the only people who matter here are the 12 people who make that ultimate decision of guilty or not guilty. And they have different vantage points. So some may see him dabbing, some may see him crying, some may see him tapping, some may see him bopping. But ultimately, a defendant is damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. If he's active, if he's crying, they say he's faking yeah. it. If he's calm and stoic, they say he doesn't show enough emotion. And that is indeed the jury's determination. The impact of Bashir's documentary on Michael Jackson's fate cannot be overestimated. Here's defense attorney Tom Mesro's cross-examination, again, according to the transcripts. Mr. Bashir, my name is Thomas Mesro, and I speak for Mr. Jackson. Thank you. At some point in time, you made an effort to contact Mr. Jackson about doing this show, correct? That is correct. And approximately when was that? I think it was around April 2002. And you contacted someone named Yuri Geller, correct? Objection, Your Honor. I think Mr. Mesereau is now straying directly into the areas covered by the California Shield Law and the First Amendment, and we would ask the court to rule that kind of inquiry off limits. Well, before we rule on that objection, I think we need to discuss the scope of the examination here. As I see it, the prosecution put him on simply to authenticate the tape. I suspect you would like to examine him at length, based on your opening statement, about a lot of things. Yes, Your Honor. Well, he does give special thanks to Mr. Yuri Geller at the end of the tape, and the prosecution played that tape, and I think they've opened the door on that one. Uh, it, it's not even in for the truth of the matter stated, Your Honor. I think I'll... Do you have him under subpoena? No. What I think I should do is limit your examination of him at this time as to the foundation of the tape. So, that's what I'm going to do. Mr. Bashir, 
In order to produce the show we've just watched, you had to speak to Mr. Jackson. True. Objection, Your Honor. Again, this is unpublished information. It's clear from the face of the tape that Mr. Bashir talked to Mr. Jackson, and that's published material, and that's the limits of the proper examination. I'll overrule the objection for the same reason I stated earlier. Objection overruled. It's clear on the tape. It's not clear on the tape. Howard Weitzman, this clearly gets in the, into the area of the California Shia law. For starters, just explain to us what that is. Very simple. It's a law enacted to protect reporters from being forced to disclose informants from either broadcast or print articles that they've been uh, involved with. Now that goes to and explains why the attorney for Bashir is talking about things like it was on the video or it wasn't on the video. And if it was on the video, he doesn't need to ask about it. I don't agree. It's, a, in my opinion, a complete abuse of the shield really? law. Really? Why? Because who is he protecting? Martin Bashir? Michael Jackson? Who, who would be the, quote, informant here? He hasn't asked him about anybody else he talked to. Uh, to me, it's, it's uh, an obstructionist tactic, and I'm not quite sure what he's trying to do, okay, except prevent the jury from hearing some facts and perhaps the truth. And we're going to see where that goes. Ricky Kleeman, one of the related issues here that we heard this judge uh, comment on and rule the scope of the arg or the scope of the examination. That is, you can't go there, uh, Mr. Defense Attorney. And he talked about something called foundation. Explain how those two work together. What the judge is saying is that the only reason Martin Bashir is testifying is to quote unquote authenticate the tape. That is, who are you? For whom do you work? When was this shot? Who are the people in there? What are their voices? He yeah. identifies yeah. and only identifies. Just to show that it's a legitimate documentary actually it is what aired, it it's not a fraud. To be. It right. is what it purports yeah. to be. That's all that he's there for. Tom Mesero wants to go into all of the background. He wants to go into Bashir's motivation for doing the story. So Mesero is going to have to call him back in the defense case. And that appears to be, Sean Chapman Holly, the implication of the judge's question. Exactly. Do you have him under subpoena, Mr. That's Mesero? Exactly right. No. Call him your darn self? Is that what yeah. this judge is saying? Yeah. So it's really going to delay the trial to a certain extent because he could get into those questions sure. right now. If the judge, well, the judge could allow that. The judge is um, making it clear that he's um, got this train on the track. Well, you guys have the train on the track. Let's hold that now. <laughs> Let me just do a toss-up for everybody. With respect to what this judge is talking about, this video, there's a lot of information in this video. I saw that original documentary, as I'm sure you did, that doesn't have anything to do with this trial, like I got a treehouse out in my yard. Or like and I'm shopping in Las Vegas exactly. for all these goods. All that stuff comes in? Why? No, it all doesn't come in. It gets back to what I said before. This judge has allowed evidence, in my opinion, before the jury that has nothing to do with the case. And the only agenda that I can see for letting this in is to inflame the jury All right. and Well, i got to defend violence. the judge for a minute. Somebody All right, let's has to defend, defend the judge when we get back. Hold on, time for minute ahead. Journalist Martin Bashir is under fire. Stay with us. Tonight's reenactments and commentary may contain frank talk of a sexual nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome back. Tom Mesereau tried and tried to portray the journalist Martin Bashir as a liar who simply buttered up Jackson with some sweet talk in order to get him to say the wrong things. As the courtroom transcript reads, here's what took place. Mr. Bashir. On the show we just saw in this courtroom, Mr. Jackson says that nothing sexual goes on in his bedroom. To obtain that statement from Mr. Jackson, you told him that when you looked at his relationship with children, it almost made you weep, correct? Same objections, Your Honor. California Shield Law and the First Amendment. And I object to that question uh, as being ambiguous. The first phrase, to obtain that statement. Object to that. The objection is overruled. Do you wish to answer that? I don't, Your Honor. Objection noted, Your Honor. Yes. Mr. Bashir, on your show, Mr. Jackson says that nothing sexual ever went on in his bedroom. 
To obtain that statement from him, you told him that you believe in his vision of an international children's holiday, correct? Same objections, Your Honor. The Shield Law and the First Amendment overruled. Shield Law, First Amendment. I can't believe yeah, yeah, yeah. Sean Chapman Holly. This judge asks the witness, would you like to answer the question? Well, you know, I think I'm going to have to go with what Howard said. It does look like maybe the train is on the tracks. And another thing Howard said yesterday appears to be what's true here, and that is that it's all in the editing. What Mr. Mesereau wants to get into is what Mr. Bashir's bias is. He had to edit this tape in sure. some way, and he's trying to get at what Mr. Bashir's agenda was in this whole thing. The judge is delaying it. What Ricky says is true. Mr. Bashir is going to have to come back and explain what his state of mind is in all of this and what he did to this tape to make it come out the way it looks. You're Agree, Howard? Not only do I agree, but this judge should never have let this tape in at this stage. And if he makes the mistake of letting it in, which I believe it was a mistake, yeah. then he should have allowed Mr. Mesereau to cross examine this witness. These objections by the lawyer representing Mr. Bashir, in my opinion, are not well taken and are done uh, w with the purpose of avoiding. Bashir having to answer questions. All right, Sean, let me get back to another issue related to what you just said. How does this line up each side? Give us who's winning, who's losing, who's ahead in the game right it's now. my favorite question. Well, oh, well, <laughs> gosh. gosh. And you're going to get the answer right after Sean does. Go ahead. <laughs> Okay, well, obviously, this documentary is having a lot of significance attached to it. Yeah. Notwithstanding what the judge says about, oh, don't listen to this, it's not offered for the truth, here it is on the screen, center stage. And I really think that if it hurts anyone, it probably hurts Mr. Jackson as it's presented. All right. Ricky, who's ahead? Well, I think the problem is this. Oh, you're, in the, you're in the objection stage. So every time Mesereau objects, he loses. The question is, does the jury resent Mesereau for objecting? Exactly. Howard, who's, who's winning? Well, I, I think jurors look to judges as somebody above the fray. They believe they're objective and don't have a, yeah. uh, an agenda. And if it comes off looking bad, it's not going to be good. For your news, I'm James Curtis. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.